Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. God's word today on which our message is centered is the 51st Psalm, words that we have spoken in the service earlier this day. In the name of Jesus, dear friends. We'll be talking about Psalm 51 and also we'll be talking about Luther's words in the Office of the Keys concerning confession this morning as well from the Catechism. King David had it made. Seemed like that. He had Bathsheba. Bathsheba's husband Uriah was dead. The whole kingdom thought that he was such a kind and a wise king for taking care of poor little Bathsheba. What a good king we have, maybe they thought. He takes care of his poor dead soldier's wife and appears that God had nothing to do with any of this, or did he? Think about that today. God knew, didn't he? He knew. God knew that David's unbelief had driven him to lust and to adultery and to, and to murder. He violated God's commandments. So God sent David a pastor, a messenger. And that messenger was a prophet who would preach to him. His name was Nathan. And Nathan came to David and he confronted David and he told him a story. We've heard that story. He used the story to approach David about his sin. And when David heard what the man in the story had done, David said that this man was guilty. He was guilty. And he said, this man should be put to death. Wow. David made that judgment about that man in the story. Nathan then directly confronted David, and Nathan says to David, you are the man. You are the man. And so David's response gets to the heart of this matter. He says, I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. But wait a minute. I thought David had sinned against Uriah. I thought he had sinned against Bathsheba. I thought he had sinned against the people of his kingdom. What did this have to do with God? What are we talking about here? And this is why we have to turn to Psalm 51 this afternoon, because David is the author of Psalm 51. And he wrote it after Nathan confronted him confronted him with his sin and we know that God forgave him but let's talk about this for a moment the line from Psalm 51 rings as true now as it did then against you you only have I sinned and done what is evil in this sight David points out that actually all sin is ultimately against God all sin is against God we have to start there and when we confess our sins to God we are saying in effect that he has every right to condemn us, that we really deserve nothing but hell, and we deserve punishment. That's because of our sinful human nature. We're born that way because of what happened in the Garden of Eden back there with Adam and Eve. Many people believe that God is arbitrary and unjust in his punishment. Why do you have to suffer for sin? Why would you be punished for sin? But we confess in this particular psalm, Psalm 51, that, that he is right and he is just in condemning us for the sin that we have committed against him. Because all sin is ultimately sin against God. All sin is finally against the first commandment that tells us, you shall have no other gods before me. This is the terror of sin that troubles our conscience, weighs on our hearts when we know that we've done what God has asked us not to do. And so we looked today and heard in the reading of the Passion history about Peter. Peter's sin. His pride would not let him see himself as a weak sinner who needed Jesus. Peter was very proud. He thought he could do it on his own. He thought he was better than the other disciples. 
It is the same kind of pride that actually eats away at each one of us when it comes to confessing our sin. You know what it is. Well, that really wasn't so bad, and I'm not really so bad, and why do I have to confess that sin? There were some visitors that came to our church one Sunday, and um, they must not have been familiar with Lutheran liturgy. They came into our church here in this place some years ago. After the service was over, they approached me and they said, Pastor, this is our first time here, and we're very offended by that part of the service called confession and absolution. They were offended by it. That's what we do at the beginning of the service, confess our sins. They told me it was very negative. They said, I want my religion to be joyful and happy. I want to hear good things. I want to feel good about coming to church. And this kind of thinking is like saying, what business does God have with my sins? That's what, that's what was being said. Because they didn't want to be confronted with their sin. They didn't think God had anything to do about their sin. And why would we even mention it or put them in that position to think about their sin? But confessing my sins is not self-pity. Remembering the words of the psalm writer, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Words from Psalm 51 that we're considering today. Now let's listen again to the words that come from Luther's small catechism when we ask that question, what is confession? I know we read it already, but let's review it again. Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive absolution. Confession and absolution. What is absolution? That is the forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself. Not doubting, Luther says, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. Maybe you memorize those words when you were preparing for confirmation. Notice that it doesn't say, I confess my sin, singular, or even generally speaking, but my sins, plural. Now, God does call us to confess our sinful human nature. You see that when I confess my sins, the things that I specifically have done that troubles me, this leads me to understand my sinful nature. You know, sometimes it's easier to confess that I am a miserable sinner in general than it is to specifically tell God about those sins that we're wrapped up in. God wants us to actually confess our sins to him. In other words, God wants us to know and acknowledge with our very lips what we have done wrong. Sometimes when we verbalize them and say them, it's shocking, even to us when we say what's in our heart. And we admit that we deserve to be punished when we do this. But then God desires that you ask him for his mercy, that you ask him for his forgiveness, and he is glad to willingly give us that forgiveness. Perhaps there's an illustration here may, uh, that may help us. Part of the disciplining of teaching children right from wrong is getting them to recognize that what they did was wrong. I remember this when I was a child, too. Um, my mother would always say to me, um, what was it that you did wrong? What was it that you did wrong? And then you have to say, I... And then you have to explain it. I, I broke the vase, the proverbial vase, or I went out when I wasn't supposed to. So you ask the children to tell you what they did wrong. And now, did my mother know what was wrong? Absolutely. She knew what was wrong. Parents know what is perfectly wrong, perfectly well, what is wrong with that child. This isn't for the benefit of the parents. No, it is really for the benefit of the child. And so it is the same way when we confess our sins. God desires that you and I confess our sins, not for him, he knows what we did wrong, 
but for you and for me. He knows perfectly well what you did, and, he will, and, and we will continue to do that at times, too. Sometimes it takes a while before we give up those things that are sinful. God wants us to see ourselves as sinners. Do you see yourself as a sinner? When you look in the mirror, do you see you're a poor, miserable sinner? Not many people like to do that. Maybe that's why those people who visited didn't like confession and absolution. God wants, to see, God wants us to see ourselves as sinners, but why? Why? Because he wants us to know that we need him. We need Jesus because Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost, the sinner, the contrite, the person who repents of their sin, the people who are messed up. That's us. We're messed up because of our sin. The ones who know that they live and move only by God's mercy. That's why we're here, only by the mercy of God. And this is why God wants us to confess our sins before him. But even this is not the final point of our lesson today. God wants us to confess our sins and see ourselves as sinners. That's true. That's what we do. But he wants this to be done so that he can respond so that he can forgive our sins. And this is God's work. God's proper work is to forgive, to love, to show mercy, and to show us his pity. And God desires to forgive our sins. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. That's what, that's what David cried out. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sin messes up our joy. It clouds things. Forgiveness restores that joy. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. What a great prayer. God, give me back the joy of living in you. Joy. And so through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our God comes to us and restores our joy. Maybe Maybe those people that didn't like that confession and absolution didn't stay long enough to hear about the joy that we have because of the forgiveness that God gives us. He comes to open our lips so that we will sing his praise. He comes to give us a new life in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. He comes to fill us with peace in knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. In other words, God comes to us to forgive us. He comes to absolve us and to free us from our guilt, the guilt of our sin. And now, if God can forgive David, King David, he can forgive you and he can forgive me. So we can pray. And we can sing. We can sing with the whole church on earth and in heaven. And we can say with the writer of Psalm 30, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.